Welcome back to IGN's History of Awesome, a year-by-year -year breakdown of big events that shape pop culture. 1991 was the year the Super Nintendo finally arrived here in North America, but that was also the year Sega unleashed its secret weapon, Sonic the Hedgehog, and so began one of the most infamous console wars of all time. On the movie side of things, Terminator 2 was one of the coolest things we had ever seen. Obviously, a lot was going on, so let's get talking. Welcome back to the History of Awesome. This is 1991 edition. I'm Damon Hatchfield. I'll be your host this time out. I'm joined by Justin Davis, hey. Megan Sullivan, Hello. Mitch Dyer, yeah. Lady and Gentlemen, the Super Nintendo was released yeah. in August of 1991 here in North America. Oh my goodness gracious. What, what a year. <laughs> what a year. Is that, what a machine. The yeah. crazy thing about the SNES is that that's two years after the Genesis. The Genesis had two wow, years really? all to yeah. itself. 89. Yeah. I never knew that in my entire <laughs> life until this moment. I'm glad you're on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm educated about video games. Uh, no, I mean, the uh, most consoles famously don't have very great launch games. Um, or that's kind of the case now. They launch sure. and build up Steam over and time. it's been the, that way for a while. The SNES launched, yeah. like, really strong, right? Like, it, it had Super Mario World packed in with it, one of the greatest games of all time. Yeah, oh that's gosh. really all you need, but they have more than that. Yeah. Even. The launch games were Super Mario World, F-Zero, Pilot Wings, SimCity, and Gradius 3. It's great. Yeah. It's an Lord. incredible lineup, yeah. right? Yeah. You should probably start with Mario World. Well, of course. I mean, the eternal, uh, you know, if you're watching History of Awesome a couple weeks ago, uh, we did 1989, I think, or 90, which is Mario 3. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, our Mario 3 Mario was on our previous episode. Yep. And those are the two games that always get put side by side. I'm a more of a Mario World guy. I myself. am also Mario World. Mario guy. World was my crack back in the day. I yeah. could not stop playing that game. I put so many hours into that yeah. game. Like I won it, and then I'd immediately start over. It was it, one of those games that when you saw it, you're like, how do video games ever look better than this? Not just yeah. better, but it had a dinosaur of multicolors. Yeah. Ride a, ride it had a, dinosaur. a cape. You could fly with Eat the some dinosaur. Apples. No kidding. Get some get some fruit in there. They got God. The, the level design of that game was so thoughtful. Yeah. Like, yeah. I love Mario 3 for many, many reasons, and uh, like, but Mario World is just so much, just moving platforms and spinning things. It just it was more complex and more alive, and it, you just had to be more aware of your surroundings. Yeah. I loved navigating that world. And it showcased what like the new tricks the uh, Super Nintendo was capable of. Like uh, Mario could rotate on the fences mm -hmm. into the background. There was oh like gosh. fog floating in front of him. You're like, oh yeah. I actually really liked, I feel like Super Mario World is that perfect combination of like uh, twitchy platforming, like you need to obviously get all your jumps right, time all that right, but also exploration and mm -hmm. secrets and puzzle solving. And I discovered, this is pre-internet, and I discovered like Star Road on my own. And I was like, what? I thought, <laughs> I thought I'd like found own. something Nobody that no, will ever believe me. No <laughs> one's ever seen this. I'm like, but it's cool. You see this like keyhole and you're like, what the hell is that? And then at a different level, you find a key and then you're like, well, what the hell is that? And then finally you figure out that the keys fit in the keyholes and there's secret exits, and then you figure out that there's secret exits everywhere, like half the levels in the game have secret yep. exits and they all lead to this whole world of secret levels, they have this crazy music, and like, that's mind blowing, like that was incredible, and like the puzzle of getting out of the forest, so to me it was that perfect combination of, uh, you know, exploring each level and the secrets of each level, and also, you know, still sort of the perfect platforming that Mario's always had. Hmm. Yeah, plus it had Bonsai Bill, which was pretty darn amazing. When I saw that thing coming at me in the very first level, it's not, that's not Bullet Bill, that is a ginormous mm -hmm. bullet coming at you in the first 30 seconds of the game. And I remember, yeah. like, that's the moment I was like, this game is going to blow my mind. And I hadn't gotten Yoshi at that point, mm -hmm. which was even better, because you can ride a dinosaur in the game. Yeah, and you got to leave him behind at certain points. Oh. Yeah, but if you left him behind, you could jump higher up. Yeah, you which could was jump higher up. That's true. also how you get Super terrible of you, exits. but it worked. So the NES and the Master System both had D-pad and two face buttons. The Genesis added a third face button, but then the Super Nintendo was like, we're gonna add, we have four face buttons and, and two, two shoulder triggers. buttons. Yes. Yeah. Those triggers so are a big, big deal. Yeah. Um, I don't know, like, so there might be some weird example from video game history that did it before. Um, so I'm always hesitant to say it's the first time you sure, ever yeah. saw that, but to my knowledge, that's the first examples of using, you know, index figures for triggers on top of a controller. Obviously became the standard. Mm -hmm. um, really smart, you know, it gave you an option to uh, uh, just press multiple buttons at once. Like, you only have one thumb pressing button, so yeah. now it really opened up a world of, like, control options. It's also the standard, like, the gold standard for every controller today, right? Like, the even the Xbox One controller is A, B, X, Y. Yeah. In that four, like, that cross layout. Yeah, that cross layout definitely won out over three buttons side by side, yeah. for sure. Um, although it made certain stuff like Street Fighter way harder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But the Super Nintendo was, was sort of what started giving Nintendo its four kids image because they would do things like censor Mortal Kombat 1, the Genesis didn't. Yep. It sort of gave 
uh, they gave Sega the opportunity to market its console in a different way. Well, it did what Nintendo don't, Damon. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard yeah, that. I mean, it really started off, it kicked off the console wars, kicked yeah. them into high gear. Uh, that was a really big deal back in the day. Like, it's still a big deal today. Was uh, everybody here a Super Nintendo kid? Yes. No, I was actually I, a Genesis kid. Wow. Okay. I, I had wow. both. Okay. <laughs> wow. I, I, I ended up with both, but growing up, I had a Genesis. And so my Super Nintendo experience was actually fantastic. You know, I played at a friend's house and I borrowed a uh, Super Metroid, and that's how I got exposed to that game. But um, I didn't own a Genesis until, or a Super Nintendo until years later. I think it was maybe the year the PS1 came out. I picked up a SNES on the cheap uh, mm. in like 95 or 96. And so I got to have that classic experience where it's like, I'm getting linked to the past. I'm getting F Zero. I'm getting Mario World, and it's like just this smorgasbord Final Fantasy uh, VI, like all these games, Chrono Trigger, I Super Metroid, get them, yeah, Super Metroid, all at once in like one summer because they were all cheap and the console was cheap, and like that's the way to do it. Like if you don't have to have the newest best thing, wait, and you get to experience it all at once. It that's, was su- such an insane console too. I mean, the library of, for the Super Nintendo is among the best in history. Arguably, I think it, you could make. The, the case that it is the best console. I'd in also history. make the argument that that's where SquareSoft became king sure. of JRPGs because yeah. you had Final mm-hmm. Fantasy IV, VI, Secret of Mana, Chrono Trigger, mm-hmm. um, I think Secret of Evermore they also yeah. did. I, so, yeah. I mean, it's mm-hmm. huge. I would say overall, the SNES library maybe, yeah, is the greatest games library. I Donkey Kong that. Country, <gasps> my favorite game of all time, Act Razor, like, yeah. Ken Griffey Jr. Baseball. <laughs> <laughs> What was so good about Ken Griffey Jr.? It was so, like, it was just regular baseball, like top-down sort of baseball, but you could rename all your players. Like, you could call them F. Mulder and D. Scully. <laughs> and you, you could, uh, when you went to catch a ball in the outfield, and you went, you were like, oh, I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it, and you ran too far, and you ran into a wall. Animation was great. You just smashed into a wall, the guy nice. fell over. Super cute. Game was super fun. Yeah, and that's all about Super Tecmo Bowl. Or Tecmo yeah. Super Bowl. It's sort of backwards. Yeah. Tecmo Super Bowl. We'll talk about Tecmo Super Bowl yeah, we will. a little bit. Yeah, we uh, did we mention Link to the Past already? No. I mean, I've mentioned it Briefly, yeah. yeah. Some people's favorite Zelda game of all time. Yeah, it's a totally respectable pick. Mm-hmm. Um, I was always... Uh, you mentioned the F-Zero is one of the launch games for that console. Yeah. Really a technical showcase, showcase for the Mode 7 graphics. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, pseudo 3D effect in that game. Mm-hmm. Um, Great. I mean, F Zero is really playable. Like, you never know with a game like that. Like, is it gonna feel clunky or is it gonna feel good if you go back and play it today? And F Zero still totally feels great. Really yeah. playable. Uh, Super Nintendo is what gave us Super Mario Kart. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. The, was the beginning of that franchise. Yep. Mario RPG. <gasps> yes. RPG, yeah, I forgot right. about that one. Much later, Mario RPG came out the same year as Mario sixty four. No kidding. Yeah. That is really cool. Maybe. Yeah. I think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I said that so definitively. Fall- might be. Justin Davis. <laughs> They may have been in separate calendar years, but they were very <clears throat> close together. Okay. I really liked the Super Game Boy ad- or the accessory for the Super Nintendo. Oh, man, like, I totally forgot about that. That yeah. was how, like, my dad and I used to play a lot of Super Nintendo together, but he had a Game Boy and I had a Game Boy, and we would just trade cartridges. But being able to play on the TV, play those games together, mm-hmm. was amazing. Yeah. Play some Cosmo Tank. Like, <laughs> the Game Boy was awesome, but no one, you, it's hard to argue against the uh, the screen. It, some games were hard to see. Like, it was, sure. they would get really blurry. Yeah. Be and then, uh, and... yeah, and then on the Super uh, Game Boy, it, that fixed that problem. Didn't play Mario certain... Land on your TV with your controller? Mm-hmm. Perfect. So you could change the color, so you'd have like a red hue or green hue yeah. or blue hue. Weren't yeah. some games like Super game... game Boy enabled? And they yeah, would actually like, have like pseudo color? Like, like Donkey Kong and the, uh, right, the uh, Link's fan... Awakening were like made uh, to, you know. Yeah. yeah, like different grays allowed them to have different kind of they would have like texture a, looks. Well, no, I they thought, have a unique border around them, and then some oh, of them could be in right. more colors. That's Donkey right. Kong, Donkey Kong 94 is the one that I really remember. If you mm-hmm. play it with a Super Game Boy, it actually is almost like a like a SNES game. Yeah. Um, I didn't remember Link's Awakening. Are you, it might be the Game Boy Color version of that game. Game Boy like Color Dungeon. I, can't, I don't recall the specifics. In any case, uh, the Super Nintendo, despite having a late start, and uh, despite fierce competition from the Genesis, would go on to be the best-selling console of the 16-bit generation. In the end. It was like the tortoise. It yeah. Slow exactly. <laughs> uh, fun fact, in South Korea, the Super Nintendo was called Super Comboy. Nice. Sure. Uh, moving on, in 1991, Civilization was released that year, the first Man. Civilization. Yeah, Sid Meier. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the thing about Civ 1 is that if you were to go back and play that game today, it's, you know, clunky, right? It's sure. a 1991 PC game. It's very, very hard I'm to... I'm sure it's to, very rudimentary compared to what you expect from a Civilization game by now. But what's surprising about it is how much of, you know, still, it's 2015, how much of Civ is there in Civ 1. It's, you start the world, is completely unsettled, it's wide open, and then cities start popping up everywhere, and, you know, a city, pl- plopping a city on the map is your way to, like, claim that territory as your own. And, uh... You know, sort of the tech tree that that sits above, like, 
you have these multiple layers of strategy. Like the you have the military game that you're playing against other people, and you have sort of the economic game that you're playing against the yep. computer. And then above that is like the tech that's sort of advancing. The scientific. Yeah, um, and all that's there in Civ One in 1991. It's so it's great. It's a game about imperial domination that doesn't require violence. You can you can like you said you can yeah. take that social political science route to become the better civilization and win that way. Yeah, brilliant. One of the first 4X games. Um, it's not literally the first, but um, you know, it wasn't. It was a strategy game that wasn't just all about military conquest, as mm -hmm. you say. Um, completely viable to play non-violently. It's awesome. Explain what 4X means. Uh, the X's are what explore, exterminate, expand. Um, uh, exploit, explore, expand, exploit, exterminate. And so that's basically it was a term coined <coughs> by a game journalist later uh, in the '90s. Um, but that's basically what it means. It's a shorthand for these games where, uh, like, you can win in a way other than you need to consider your economy and mm -hmm. your culture and things other than just your uh, 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 military. And this is a genre that's still strong today. What I like about Civ, uh, Civ One, and all the rest of the Civ games is that turn-based nature of them means that you're always like so close to like if I just play one more turn, I'm gonna complete you know my pottery tech, yep. and in one more turn, this city's gonna upgrade. It's and only twenty more turns until my uh, notable yeah. monument is done. I should just finish that one, and then I'll go to bed. And then it, it was yeah. the f it was it wasn't Civ One. The first one that I got really into was Civ Three, I think, and it was one of the very first games that uh, like made me literally lose track of time. I'd be like, yeah. oh my god, it is the middle of the night, and I mm -hmm. just, I just, like, I'd never experienced that before. Like, yeah. even games that I really like. It's a liked. weird feeling. Yeah. Civ 4 did that to me. You yeah. know, you're playing a game, and you think, ah, it's fine, I've only played for a little bit, and you look out, and it is literally dawn. Yeah. Yep, because cause you're always one turn away from something mm -hmm, awesome happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, also in 1991, uh, Street Fighter 2. Yeah, Street Fighter 2. Da -da 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 which is obviously da -da 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 -da. quite a phenomenon. Yeah, oh yeah. Still going strong today. Amazing arcade game, coming to the Super Nintendo later. Yeah, uh, and it was, it was a system a seller for the Super Nintendo. And a surprisingly good port. You know, you don't expect an arcade fighter to work well on a console with like little crummy D-pad and some yeah. buttons. Worked out really well. Probably the most important fighting game of all time. Arguably the best. Yeah. Still, man, they remade that, like Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo HD Remix, heck of a name, mm -hmm. that it was like beautiful, it was a beautiful remake that, you know, they redid all the art, but pixel for pixel, it was the exact same game. And it just proved that you can have an, that, that kind of design, that core design holds up for decades. Mm -hmm. Actually, really, uh, it's interesting that Street Fighter II became one of the console war games. If I'm not mistaken, I actually didn't get a chance to, to fact check this before we came in here, but uh, the Super Nintendo had Hyper Street Fighter II, right? And the Genesis had Street Fighter II Championship Edition. I'm, I'm hazy on the details. And I think that's how it worked. And I had Championship Edition on the Genesis that added the four playable, mm -hmm. the bosses were playable characters. Mm. Uh, my favorite anecdote about Street Fighter 2 is that uh, the combo system, which the entire fighting game genre is sort of the foundation, it's all built on that, was the bug. It was an accident. Really? Um, and they left it in. They discovered it and chose to leave it in. They realized that if you started one move before the previous had finished, you could cancel some frames and get in extra hits and uh, land a combo, like three or four hit combos on people. And that was not intended, like Street Fighter 2 wasn't designed with that in mind. Um, and now it's, it, it's core to succeeding yeah, and then pro they, play. Then they doubled down on it and made super combos and sort of made it into, the, an, into an actual part of the gameplay. But it was an accident in Street Fighter 2. That's amazing. You know the best part of that game is the sounds. Yeah. Like, oh, ooh, 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 ooh. Sonic <laughs> Boom. Ooh. Tiger, tiger, <laughs> uppercut. And whatever of you says, what is this kick? Yeah. This kick? Bah, 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 bah. yeah. <laughs> what is this kick? <laughs> Yeah, it is really good, and all the it's like it's like vaguely racist, <laughs> like all Some the characters it, yep, the and stages, but it's it's right. But the music is genuinely amazing. It holds up really well, yeah. and they yeah. had OC Remix do it for the the re-release, mm. the HD Remix, and it just hearing that music remade reminds me how strong it really was. Yeah, uh, composed by I can't remember her name now, but um, there were just not a lot of women working in video games, and she was a female composer. Did the music? Did a lot of Capcom's. Classic she did music. Mega Man stuff too, I think. Yeah, yeah not sure. Um, and I watched a documentary on her, and she said um, the the music is a little bit stereotypical too, and that was intentional. Like it was designed to be um, culturally appropriate, sort of. A little bit, o almost, almost inappropriate. Like just a little hammy. That's sure. all. Like almost a little humorous. Like the story, like the music. Like let's get really stereotypical, like Chinese music for the sure. Chinese stage, yeah. for example. It's exaggerated. Yeah, exactly. It was so popular in arcades, it started the whole fighting game boom of the 90s mm -hmm. with Mortal Kombat, mm -hmm. Samurai Showdown, King of Fighters, uh, Killer Instinct, all of those games. But then it was also just an, an arcade renaissance. Arcades had 
risen to popularity in the 80s, and then it sort of started to die off a little bit, but then Street Fighter was like... Pfft. It's yeah. funny, because Street Fighter 2 is so popular, nobody remembers Street Fighter 1, because it wasn't very good, but yeah, yeah. No. like Street Fighter 2 is the genesis of that entire series. I What's... cannot think of an arcade that did not have Street Fighter 2. Yeah, yeah or even everywhere, bars, uh, you know, laundromats. My laundromat has Street yeah. Fighter 2. We uh, the the brilliant thing about Street Fighter Two from like a business perspective or from an arcade perspective is um, so so arcade owners or arcade game designers want to get you out get the player out in under three minutes and get another quarter in the machine like that's they're designed to like kill you in mm -hmm. three minutes um, and that kind of sucks especially if you catch on to that in like a yeah. single player game if you're playing you know whatever Gauntlet or Asteroids or something it's or like Pac-Man a, a brawler is thirty minutes long but it takes you eight dollars in five right. days like it's it's they're kind of baloney like the games are designed to keep you pump, pumping yep. quarters into it and so that's what makes fighting games so brilliant is that it got around that like the matches were short and the winner got to stay and then the loser was out like that's the way those games worked so we actually had a Street Fighter Two machine, and my family owned a bar, and I would go there and uh, you know work, do some work behind the scenes with the family when I was little. You'd hustle all the old bar. Yeah, bar like I was like the Street Fighter Two. Yeah, I was. Like, I oh, would... what's, what's this? How does this work? <laughs> I, and I would smoke all the adults at the game, and I would stay at the go arcade machine. Go home and be a family man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Interesting story They'd about that. Break That's a, a pool cue over your head. That's a little eight-year-old head. Uh, for the... a Giles, go home and be a family man. Yeah. yeah. In the Japanese version, he's so much nicer. He's like. Go back to your home country, you know, take care of your family or something like that. Yeah. It's so much nicer, but in like the They American made it harsher version. in the American version. Yeah, it's like, it's oh, awesome. I'm going to be a family man. He says it to Chun Li all the time, cracks me up. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't really think that one through, did they? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Street Fighter 2 also popularized the concept of one on one video game tournament fighting, whereas before that, it'd be like you're, everyone's just working on their own to get their high scores. Yeah. Right? And now you actually have two people in real time going head to head. It's great. And now, smart. Smart. now we have Eva. Yeah, exactly. Thanks to Street Fighter. Uh, now, we were talking about the success of the Super Nintendo earlier, but in 1991, uh, Sonic the Hedgehog was released for the Sega Genesis. The same and that year. was a huge headache for Nintendo <laughs> and the Super Nintendo. That was like their arch nemesis. Well, what's crazy about that, I mean, we touched on it at the top of the show, but that means it's just, it blows my mind that the Genesis existed for two years without Sonic. Yeah. It's just so weird. Like, it's so strange. You would never, like, they're so intertwined with each other. I mean, gun to your head, you'd say, like, yeah, it was the launch title. Yeah, it was the launch sure. title. Yeah, it, it, it didn't, and it replaced Altered Beast as the pack in game. Oh, yeah. man. That's a good thing, because yep. Altered Beast was. That okay, game was yeah. a butt game. Yeah, <laughs> true. It's true. It is. Sonic the Hedgehog started the uh, mascots with attitude. Yep. yep. So, S Sonic Team. Uh, the developers that worked on Sonic were told to create a game with a mascot that could rival Mario. And they thought, they had Alex Kidd, but they thought Alex Kidd was too similar to Mario, so they ended up coming with this blue hedgehog that was really fast. Get, get rid of this white man. Bring me, yeah. a, <laughs> bring me a blue animal. Yeah. Actually, Diverse. really, uh, again, I was a Genesis kid growing up, so I have very, very fond memories of Sonic the Hedgehog. You know, Sega. Do, 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 yeah, do, do, the music's do, do, do. really, really so good. good. Like, I'm not a yeah. huge Sonic fan, but that music is burned into my brain. Do, so do, great. Yeah. And I actually think um, Sonic... It gets a bad rap from people, including me. Um, like the games maybe didn't necessarily age so well. But what people need to understand is that that was so fast. That was mind blowingly fast. That game blew my mind yeah. back in the day. Like that's a big deal. Like it's it's easy. Like it's such a it's such a sort of uh, uh, trope to just say, oh, Sonic's fast. Like it's a meme now, right? How fast is gotta Sonic? go fast. Yeah. But like that's it, it, the, those level, levels would just blaze by, and uh, the loops that he would go through, and all that stuff. Like, he rewarded dude, you for going that quickly too, right? You'd be you'd be going so fast you didn't know what to do. Yeah. And it would reward re it would reward you for going off course, finding secret paths, hitting yeah. bumpers that would send you somewhere you didn't up expect. Things in the sky that you can fly yeah, up to. Yeah, it was to. great. There just never been anything like that. There'd never been anything that felt like that yeah. before Sonic. Sonic the Hedgehog was it. It was what Sega had been looking for for years during the 8-bit era. Sega got obliterated by Nintendo, and then they were first to market in the 16-bit uh, era. They had two years on Nintendo, but still the Nintendo brand was so strong that people were waiting for the Super Nintendo. But when they had Sonic the Hedgehog, that was it, because at the time the Sega Genesis had ten times the game library of the Super Nintendo. And from then on, Sega outsold Nintendo for four Christmases in a row. Wow. Oh my yeah. gosh. That got, killer app. Yeah. <laughs> And this year, in 1991, I was six, and I got it. I mean, I got a Genesis that Christmas. I was a little Justin got a Sega Genesis because he was already obsessed with video games at that age, and it felt like Sonic felt noticeably like next gen compared to like I don't know. Like the NES games are great. Like arguably, the NES like the actual game design 
in something like Mario 3 is much better than Sonic the Hedgehog. But to see those games side by side, one felt so much yep. newer and brighter and faster. Like, it was something that... There's a distinct look to Genesis. Sonic 1 mm -hmm. is the first time I can remember a game, like, kind of blowing my mind. For sure. And Echo the Dolphin, even though I couldn't get past the first level <laughs> because of that stupid jump or whatever uh -huh. you're supposed to do. Uh, you mentioned the, the other mascot games that followed in the wake of Sonic. Yeah, you had <laughs> Bubsy... Uh, what else? There's James Pond, Earthworm Jim, Gex the Gecko, Arrow the Acrobat, Vector Man, Rocket Knight. All of these games came in the wake of Sonic the Hedgehog. Crash later. Uh, now we mentioned Tecmo Super Bowl earlier. Mm -hmm. Also a 1991 game. So good. Nice. I can't remember. I had a, a Tecmo something bowl on my Game Boy. I don't know if it, it mm -hmm. couldn't be a Super Bowl game, right? Could it just be Tecmo Bowl? Tecmo Bowl, mm -hmm. Tecmo Super Bowl. It's got to be a super game because of Super Nintendo. But man, but Tecmo was, made some great NFL games. That was significant because it was the first time that a uh, video game was allowed to use both real teams and real players. That's how I learned the entire roster for the 49ers. I blew yeah. adults' minds with that because <laughs> I'd be like, oh, Roger Craig and Ronnie Laud and Joe Montana. Be, how do you know this? You're like yeah. seven. And I'm like, oh, I play this game. Bo <laughs> Jackson, great. super oh OP God, in right, that game. Jackson. Super OP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he just plows He just threw everything. bombs, just, man. 100-yard yeah. bombs. <laughs> That's the thing, like I wasn't a big sports gaming guy back then, and I'm actually still not, but I can really respect Tecmo Super Bowl sort of arcade, uh, yeah, like, like the arcade foundation that it's yeah. all built on. It's like that and Blades of Steel have such yeah. important parts in my gaming history. Yeah. 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 And I'm the game a... had cutscenes too, which was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, the sweet touched... high five, oh, <laughs> every time we got down, oh my god. Uh, yeah, I'm not a big football fan, but I played tons of Tecmo Super Bowl with my dad. It was really accessible. Too. Like it was really anybody could just pick up and this like the character runs where you point them. Like there's yeah. pass, run. Like the buttons are really easy. But it's actually still like there's a lot going on under the hood. Like it's fairly yeah. complex and sophisticated. It doesn't have like three different modes too. Yeah, it's, it's got a playbook. You can play seasons. You yep. win the Super Bowl. Yep. And I think there's still sort of like a community playing that game today. Yeah, but it's not on virtual console, right? Like they still haven't. Mm. Probably can't be because of licensing. probably yeah. licensing issues. Yeah. Yeah, which kind of sucks. Flipping over to the entertainment side of things, mm -hmm. in 1991, Terminator 2. Oh my yeah. god. The big summer movie oh my in 1991. Thank you, James Can we yeah. just talk about this movie for the next sure. 90 minutes? Yeah. I mean. <laughs> because I could talk about Terminator 2 forever. The best thing about Terminator 2 is you go a pretty significant amount of time in that film not knowing he's a good guy. That that's, was so cool that they flipped the script and turned yep. the bad guy into the good guy. Yep. That scene in the mall. Well, you got the two Terminators, yes, and you've got yeah. John running through, and, and so you've then, got Robert Patrick's character. And they give in. Arnold Schwarzenegger the line, come with me if you want to live. Yep. So good. Yeah. Yep. That moment, though, where he steps out of the elevator and yeah, runs into Sarah Connor, yeah. and she's just... walking down the hallway. She, she hasn't hallway. seen that in so many years, and she's been in this mental home. Oh, my God. He's got to watch this movie. <laughs> Every time he goes down to that lava with the thumbs up, I just cry like yep. a baby. Yep, yep, yep. We're all going to go watch T2 tonight. Yeah, yeah man. Or sure. uh, the truck scene yeah. with the yeah. motorcycle. Oh, God, it's so good. The action beats are just immaculate too. Like there'd been action movies before. There've been great action movies before, but like action directing um, as an art form, um, you know, really, in my opinion, kind of came up, came into its own with T two. James Cameron. Like, yeah. He's, yeah. Uh, he did amazing work with Aliens, also. Yep. Uh, it's a rare instance of a, a sequel that's even better than the original, which was already yeah. incredible. Yep. Maybe. maybe. I'm gonna disagree a little. Terminator One is still my favorite action movie ever. Oh, really? Nice. Yes. Wow. Okay. Mostly because I didn't like John Connor as a little kid. Mm, when he's well. like, don't say that, say no Edward problemo. And I'm like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, it, was also, it was a huge breakthrough in uh, computer uh, graphics. Yeah, I mean, you have T-1000 getting a whole shot through his chest, and you see Robert Patrick yeah. with this, like, goopy-looking mercurial metal oh, man. Right. hole in his chest. You could, like, you can see through Robert Patrick. That's insane. It comes back together. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's, like, walking through walls and... Yeah, although and, we were talking about it before the camera started rolling about, there's that scene where Robert Patrick's T-1000 is going through the bars and mm -hmm. he gets caught yep. because of his gun. So it's like yeah. this blend of CGI and like yeah. practical effects. Yeah, it's really smart. I mean, I think that CG actually really holds up, like mm. surprisingly. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it doesn't look, it's not like I'm fool, like I know it's fake, but still like there's movies that came out a decade later that in my opinion have less convincing CG than uh, Terminator 2, which sure. really pioneered a lot of it. They had, you know, they, it was the things they were trying to do with CGI were, were insane for the time, so James Cameron used the Abyss as sort of proof of concept. Yeah, sort with of the, like the we weird water monster yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. and Michael Bean going crazy. Yeah, that's so a good like movie. Like he does. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, it was the highest grossing film worldwide <clears throat> in 1991. James Cameron, man, don't ever bet against him. Yeah. yeah. No, Even now, people are like, Avatar 2, 3, and 4, I don't know. Hey, okay. You bet against <laughs> James Cameron at your own risk. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It might take him a thousand years to make a movie, but <clears throat> it's fun. always good. 
And then I think winning Best Picture for 1991 was Silence of the Lambs. Is that right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Very, Very creepy. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I didn't know, you know, I've seen the movie like everybody else, you mm -hmm. know, liked it. It's, certain parts of it are burned in my mind, but uh, uh, his name is escaping me. The main Anthony character. Hopkins? Uh, Anthony Hopkins. Hannibal yes. Lecter. He's only in that movie for 16 minutes. Wow, and he's in yeah. jail like the whole time, right? Yeah. Well, sort of. Towards the end, they have to transfer. Sure, yeah, of course. Like, think about how much of an impact he makes with only that tiny amount of screen time. Yeah. It's I mean, like, I, the line, hello, Clarice, is burned into everyone's brain yeah. forever. Mm -hmm. It's so haunting just the way he says that. And actually, like, like it's really, obviously, well acted. He won Best Actor for it. But it's also, like, he's not above, like, it being a little bit hammy. Whereas sure. There's just certain lines where he's like, you know, I... He's, how does it go? He's like, I'm having a friend for dinner. I'm yeah. having an old friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, I wish I could chat longer, having an old friend for dinner. Yeah. There was a, you know, I, I was young when I saw this. There are some words that I, adult words that I learned from watching this movie that cannot be repeated here. <laughs> yeah, that's for true. Sure. It was also uh, released on Valentine's Day, which I think is Aww. Yeah. <laughs> what what a movie. The date movie of 1991. <laughs> <laughs> We Beating the Beast. Ninety-two babies in this room. We, uh, the, I think the last intro. You mentioned it won Best Picture. Um, yeah. But Silence of the Lambs is one of only a few movies to win the Big Five. So mm. it won Best Director, Best Screenplay, Best Actor, Best Actress, and Best Picture. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I and again a double double ups to Anthony Hopkins for winning Best Actor for that tiny amount of screen time. Yeah. I mean it's sure. unbelievable. Uh, also nominated for Best Picture that year was Beauty and the Beast, Yay. notable for being the first animated film nominated for Best Picture. Yeah, it's rad. Yeah, that ballroom scene. Like, mm -hmm. I still get chills because yeah. the CGI in that, like, the way they did it was really nicely done. So yeah, when they, it's like, a cameras, big, like, big room. Yeah, it's a huge room, so when I saw it on screen, it was mind-blowing. And then when the camera sort of pans down from, like, the chandelier, and then, you know, you see her dress go by. Like, that was all, like, 3D, and it was... Mm -hmm. Totally different than anything else before yeah. it. I don't think it's, I, I, you know, again, it's always, I'm always hesitant to say it's the first time something was I know done. what you're going to say, and it's the second. Because before, the previous Disney movie was The Rescuers Down Under, and that was the and first time the they started to use it using computer-generated wow. animation. Let's start this combination of hand-drawn 2D, you know, animation yeah. cells with 3D backgrounds. Um, the Little Mermaid was the last traditionally hand-drawn uh, Disney film. And oh, then, so there, then there was Rescuers Down Under, and then there was Beauty and the Beast. Oh, so it wasn't, even the 2D stuff wasn't hand-drawn? In what? Beauty and the Beast. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's the mix, yeah. It's all traditional, okay, but okay. it's got the, the last of no, The last film to not use any CGI. Got it. This, like every Disney movie, right, you look at any Disney film and you start noticing things as an adult you didn't before, but it's really interesting to see, like, that, that Beast Gaston fight is really interesting because one of them is fighting over Belle for love and the other is fighting over her for possession. Hmm. And that's not something you think about when you're a kid. You just see Gaston as the bad guy. And you yeah. don't really understand why. You're like, oh, he's kind of mean, I guess, but it's... Like most early Disney movies, really thoughtful, really smart, really heartfelt in a way that, as an adult, I'm like deeply touched by. Mm. Well, right in '91, uh, Disney's right at the peak of their sort of just their 2D animation empire, I guess, or so the renaissance of their 2D animation yeah, empire. Yeah, Little Mermaid, Aladdin, uh -huh, Little Lion Mermaid, King. Aladdin, mm. Lion, Lion, King, the Beast, Lion King, yeah. and um, just this incredible string of movies that you know wouldn't really be matched or topped until you know Pixar had their incredible string yeah. of movies. You know, a decade later. Pixar being the company that developed all this computer animated techniques that they were using in these films. Yeah, there's definitely, there actually is a connection there that I mm -hmm. think a lot of people maybe don't know. Sticking with the animation, Ren and Stimpy was a huge part <laughs> of my childhood. Man. I loved Ren and Stimpy. Megan and, it, and I were talking about this before we started shooting. Ren and Stimpy is one of those shows that the, my, my parents hated it. Yeah. They saw the characters, they were just like, this is dumb and they're ugly and this isn't funny. And I was like, I, I don't know why I'm watching this because Every time they do something in this show that's gross, I don't want to watch it, but they do it so often that I'm like compelled <laughs> to keep seeing all these like weird close-ups of like yeah, a mole yeah. on someone's face. Yeah. It's like so gross and weird. And it's trippy too. Like we were talking about this, like there's one where it's Stimpy's fan club and Ren literally goes insane and is about to kill Stimpy and it's the freakiest thing I've ever seen. But before that, he's trying to write letters to Stimpy and be nice to kids, and he can't do it. Yeah. So he keeps calling them stupid and idiots and how they make him sick. It's, so it's a weirdly aggressive show, too. Like, Ren is not a cool guy. No. No, no he's so mean like, to Stimpy. It was picked to be on Nickelodeon alongside uh, Rugrats and Doug, Doug. I think, as yeah. their, like, Sunday morning, like, cartoon lineup. Yeah. I mostly skip Ren and Stimpy to watch Doug. 
man. Doug was just like, all right, I just need some like positivity in my life. I mean, where's Patty Mayonnaise at? Yeah, Ren and Stimpy was. I mean, I watched it when I was six, seven, eight, nine years old, and I loved it. I laughed at it. But I have memories, like vague memories of Little Justin. Like that show freaking me out. Yeah. yeah it's really weird. It's really like, creepy. And I remember Ren, I didn't like how mean he was to yeah. Stimpy. I just wanted them to be friends. Um, they really got away with a lot yeah. on that yeah. show. Was, if, yeah. No, go I, was ahead. Just gonna, I was just going to say, if you remember too, like there'd, it would go on hiatus all the time because there was so much drama behind yeah. the scenes. Like the creator got kicked off the show in season yeah. two, which is why Billy West did both Ren and Stimpy after wow. that. And one was, so Ren's supposed to be. Peter Lorre from like Casablanca and Maltese Falcon, yeah, right. and then the other is supposed to be Curly, mm. from, or Snippy's supposed to be Curly from the Three, Three Stooges. Stooges. So now I can't like whenever I hear Curly, I'm like, oh, it's Snippy, yeah. as opposed to the other way around. <laughs> it's interesting that uh, there's a lot of subtext in that show when it originally aired, but it was a kids show, so they couldn't bring a lot of it to the surface. And when it came back as an adult show on. Spike, I think. Yeah, um, I don't think it did whatever well. network. Spike like MTV. They brought it back, and they the characters were gay. You know, like just they were out of the closet. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I never saw those. I, I never saw this. Me either. Uh, finally, in 1991, Sin City uh, made its first run in uh, Dark Horse Comics. Yeah, this Dark is the one most people would know as the Hard Goodbye, the one mm-hmm. about Marv. Mm-hmm. Such a great book. I mean, this is say what you will about Frank Miller, the guy is. Not, May- not the coolest human being in the world. Nope. Maybe Guy a crazy person. <laughs> yep. I think definitely a crazy person. Uh, yeah. Vaguely misogynist, problematic writing in a lot of his books. Incredible artist, very yep. good writer in a lot of ways. Sin City is an amazing book. Well, and this one came together in virtually every way. Like, it's yeah. just incredible. And, uh, you know, a lot of people that are fans of the movie maybe don't even recognize that that movie is almost a shot-for-shot shot remake of the book. They like literally this. did not make storyboards because they had books. Yeah, yeah the, they used the book as the storyboard. So, I mean, that just shows you how it was. It was, it was renowned at the time in 91 for uh, being illustrated in this film noir style with a yeah. contrasting light and dark. And uh, they didn't really need to make any changes to that when they, when they ended up turning it into a film. Yeah, had a very cool look to it. Did the was the were the comics entirely black and white? Did, did they yes. use blood? No, there were some splashes. The oh yeah, yeah. there were there blood. were moments of color, okay. but they were very sparing. It was it was the same as the film. It wasn't just blood. There would be splashes Lips, of red and yellow and yeah, eyes. exactly. Yeah, but they were primarily black and white, and that and they weren't even not it not only was it black and white, but it was like contrasting black and white, like like just deep black next to bright white. Yeah. You know, yeah. it wasn't even yeah. a lot of like shades of gray in there. That yeah. makes it really striking. Well, and then like the next book, That Yellow Bastard, was about this dude who like, he was literally just bright yellow. So yeah. he was always lit up in yellow on, mm. on the page. You know, another book uh, in the 80s and 90s that was showing that graphic novels could be, you know, more yeah. than... Uh, They're not kids' books. ...than what they had been. Sure. Yeah, uh, a few years before, we'd had The Dark Knight Returns mm-hmm. and Watchmen mm-hmm. and, you know, Sin City is just right in line with like that expansion of the medium. Yeah. The first Sin City movie is really good. <laughs> I, I've wondered recently if it's held up, and I also, I still, I realize now, I've never seen Sin City 2. Dame to Kill 4, not so good? Uh, I didn't see it. No, no one seems to think that, <laughs> no one seems to enjoy the second film. All right. So I haven't even checked it out. I think that brings us to the end of our 1991 History of Awesome recap. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Mitch. My name is Damon Hatfield. Uh, stay tuned for 1992 Ooh. up next.